morning. Uh, I'd like to talk about current status of furosemide in diabetic macular edema. I have no financial disclosure. Diabetic macular edema is defined as retinal thickening within one disc diameter of the center of the macula. It is the most common cause of visual loss in diabetic patients. In terms of prevalence, WHO estimates around 171 million people had DME in the year 2000. This is expected to rise to 366 million by 2030. Various factors are involved in the pathogenesis of diabetic macular edema. Among the factors, an escalating VGF level is set to play a critical role. This finding led VGF to become a treatment target. Reports on VGF say that the vitreous concentration of VGF was significantly higher in patients with DME than in non-diabetic patients or diabetic patients without retinopathy. Such results led to the use of anti-VGF for diabetic macular edema. There are currently available medications, Macrozen, Lucentis, Avastin, and Aphilisep. Let me touch upon the Vibacizumab. FDA approved its use for colorectal cancer, not for ocular disease. It is the most broadly used medication due to cost benefit and availability. This table shows the clinical studies of Vibacizumab in DME. Among these five, I'd like to have a look at the representative studies, DRCRLET and BOLT study. TRCRLET was a phase two randomized clinical trial of intravitreal Vibacizumab on DME. This study showed that the groups who received 1.25 mg and 2.5 mg Vibacizumab showed better result than the laser group. 12 months data of both study was released in last year. In this study, 80%, 80 patients with CSME were randomly divided into bevacizumab arm and macular laser therapy arm. Bevacizumab was given three times in a row at six week interval and retreatment was determined based on, based on OCT findings. At 12 four months, vision showed plus 8.6 letters in the Vivacizumab group and minus 0.5 letters in the macular laser group. This graph shows the superiority of Vivacizumab over macular laser therapy. The central macular thickness decreased significantly in the Vivacizumab group. The BOLT study demonstrated that Vivacizumab has a greater treatment effect than macular laser treatment in patients with persistent CSME at 12 months. And the greater efficacy of Vivacizumab was maintained through 24 months. This study also provides evidence for the longer term use of Vivacizumab in the treatment of persistent direct macular edema. Now, let's have a look at the result of a Pan-American collaborative retinal study. Anatomical and functional outcome at 12 four months in diffuse direct macular edema patients were assessed in three groups of intravitreal vivacizumab, grid laser photocoagulation, and combination. Let's have a look at changes in best correct visual acuity in intravitreal VLCMAP and plus grid laser photocorrelation groups. There was significant difference from baseline best correct visual acuity at all time points of follow-up. In the grid laser photocorrelation group, there was no significant difference until the first six months of treatment. In central macular thickness, intervitreal VLCMAP produced greater decrease in central macular thickness than the other groups. Now, 
I'd like to move on to talk about our study. We tried to identify the effect of Vuasizumab based on OCT pattern of DME. A re retrospective study was made for 49 patients who were followed up for more than 12 months after three consecutive injections every six weeks. Based on the OCT findings, patients were classified into three groups of diffuse retinal thickening, cystoid macroedema, or serous retinal detachment. As seen here, bevacizumab was more effective in diffuse retinal thickening type than in the cystoid macroedema or serous retinal detachment types. Now, Let's move on to compare bevacizumab used off-label with FDA-approved anti-VGF agents. Which anti-VGF agent is superior? Let's compare them in terms of efficacy, safety, economics. In 1999, more than Dante et al. insisted that the difference in the interocular uh, tissue distribution and pharmacokinetics might be responsible for the higher efficacy of ranivizumab than vivacizumab. However, Heiduska et al. showed in an animal model that vivacizumab can penetrate, penetrate the retina into the photoreceptor outer segments after intravitreal injection. Next is efficacy. So far, there are no published randomized clinical trials to show the relative clinical effectiveness of bevacizumab and ranibizumab in DME. In 2012, four data made an indirect comparison in a systematic review and found no difference in effectiveness between bevacizumab and ranibizumab. However, they came to the conclusion that the wide incredible intervals would not exclude the possibility that either drug might be superior. Then let's have a look at safety. There has been no last study conducted yet in DME. Schumacher and I listened to the list of safety review and meta-analysis of Vivacizumab and Ranibizumab, where it came to conclusion that currently it was not possible to rule out a critical relevant risk for serious adverse effects under the use of unlicensed Vivacizumab. Next, we have to consider their economic benefits. Smith showed an economic merit of Vivacizumab in diabetic macroedema patients. In tables, laser showed uh, around $6,000 per year. We also uh, met, depends on uh, study, $2,000, $4,000. Rani Vizmet, $20,000 per year. In conclusion, the anti VGF drugs represent a significant advance in the treatment of DME. Vivacizumab is clinically effective for DME, even though it is not licensed for it, and Vivacizumab could be a cost-effective treatment compared with expensive licensed alternatives with similar outcomes. The choice of drug for a patient with DME must be made based on a full comparison in terms of their effects on vision differences in adverse events and costs per dose. Thank you for your attention.